the house of death. It happened again. Believed to be still today, living and walking. Well, recently we hadn't, well... Had intercourse. There's no need to be embarrassed about discussing sexual matters with me. I had an abortion a few months ago. Are you afraid? Afraid of the man who defiled you? I was put on this earth to combat sin, and I shall use every available means to do so. That priest I went to see is insane. She threw herself out of a window. My poor woman. Don't pretend you're upset. I know you killed her. Did you say you lived with Miss Welch? Yeah, that's right. Last two years. The man who deserted her? The man who forced her to abort your child? You're changing the subject. And I ain't leaving without that tape. You can't put in more earth than you take out, can you? Oh, Father. There's a mind. And if there's a mind, there's got to be something inside, hasn't there? I was right to punish this man. To destroy the face that charmed and lured you. Are you going to come and see me, Jenny? Or am I going to have to play this tape to somebody else? Hi, this is Tom Matthews, and you're listening to the Hysteria Continues podcast. And indeed you are. Welcome back to the Hysteria Continues. Uh, this time we're going back to merry old England uh, and another one of Pete Walker's shockathons. House of Mortal Sin, a.k.a. The Confessional, a.k.a. The Confessional Murders from 1976. His controversial follow-up to uh, Frightmare, uh, which is Eric's choice. So I was going to say this is episode 313, 313. Um, Eric, how are you doing today? I'm doing okay, thank you very much. Excellent. Is it warm in your in your undercarriage? Yes, but supremely cloudy, as only you would expect from Dublin. <laughs> so why, why are you putting on an English accent then? I don't, I don't know. Maybe <laughs> it's the influence of the House of Mortal Sin. It could. Well, there's lots of lots of plums in the mouths in the uh, House of Mortal Sin. Very very mid seventies English. Uh, so they even even with the atrocities, the Catholic atrocities of um, of being whacked around the face with uh, uh, what are they what are they called? Those things. Is it an incense burner? It's called a censer, apparently. Is it so? If the if you haven't seen it, it's like a it's like an incense burner, but in a uh, cylinder, uh, it was a spherical kind of container on a on a, a chain, and it was swung. And I actually remember those from um, Catholic mass back in the seventies as a kid. So we'll talk about that and uh, see if any of us are lapsed Catholics uh, when we do. But um, but I'm getting ahead of myself. So uh, someone who's not um, who's not a stranger to smoke. How are you doing today, Nathan? Uh, I'm not well, but mm. I'm here, and I will persevere. Did you get it? It rhymed. Kind of, but we do appreciate it because obviously, Nathan, you are you are recovering from uh, something, and so we do. You know, this goes to show, you know, what we do to bring you a show. Let me just say to all our listeners, please, for the love of God, drink water. Learn from my mistakes, please. Learn from them. We will be drinking lots of water, won't you? Oh, yes. I've got a humongous container of it right here. Okay. Well, that's good. Is vodka the same, or is that... I oh, know that's kind of looks like water. Oh, I mean, vodka can make me feel better, or at least make me not care about the pain, but... <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, fair enough. Well, it's speedy recovery to you, Nathan. So, I'm sure so the time we record next, uh, hopefully you'll be uh, back to your pain-free self. So, and Joseph, um, uh, how are you doing this morning? Uh, I can't complain. Okay. Do you want me to complain? Well, you could, well, yeah. What are you going to complain about? Um, dog vomit. Yeah, dog vomit. I had to clean up some dog vomit this morning, so um, I'll complain about that for five seconds. Um, I don't like cleaning up dog vomit. It's very nasty. Um, yeah. It was yellow and nasty and sickly looking. But there, five seconds over with. Yeah, I think vomit's the worst for me. Worse than poo. Well, I think it's the, the smell of it. I think it's that kind of acidic. But anyway, we don't really want to. People are not listening for the. For the I think maybe, horrors so of maybe they type. are listening for that. Yeah, they want to know which is worse, poo or vomit. <laughs> no, I think they're listening for filmic horrors rather than real life kind of um, uh, scatological and biological horrors. But anyway, we won't bring you. That will be a different show. Maybe it's a Patreon special, although maybe not. 
Um, so anyway, uh, yes, we are back. It is hot as hell here. So, um, so again, sweating through, bring you the hysteria continues. Um, and uh, what have we been watching recently? And Eric, I believe I haven't caught up with it yet, but I believe you caught up with a, a movie this week. Oh yeah, I saw Maxine. Which is, of course, Ty West's uh, sequel to Pearl and uh, X. Um, yeah, so I would kind of agree with what Joseph wrote about it on the Hysteria Lives website. I think it's the weakest of the three. I mean, I still enjoyed it, but um, it do- it didn't have the sort of um, the wow factor, I suppose, of Pearl in particular. Like Pearl had a real sort of heart to it as well as a nastiness to it that I really liked, and that's kind of missing from X. X is or Maxine, sorry. And Maxine's a sort of a colder film. I did love the the sort of eighties look, the eighties hairstyles. The director of this film that Maxine has got herself booked on has these huge shoulder pads that would be, um, you know, at home on Dynasty or Dallas, uh, and are very nineteen eighty five. Um, it has some, it has, like it has one standout gruesome moment involving a stiletto and a scrotum, um, but uh, it's it's not overly violent i would say apart from that um and yeah um i'd like to watch it again just to 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 see what i think because it does take some twists in the final half hour that are kind of a bit gonzo but um no i I mean i i really enjoyed it i think the trilogy is is works really well uh i just just (laughs) I was hoping for more for Maxine, to be honest, because it was going to be set in 1985, which is kind of the, you know, a sweet spot for me. Um, And I was hoping to have that sort of be be sort of knocked out by it like I was with Pearl. But um, but it's still it's still really entertaining, I thought. And it's it's one hour 40 ish, I think. So it's not too long. Because I know, um, Joseph, you reviewed it for Hysteria Lives. I haven't seen it yet. I know it's just kind of come onto streaming. But um, I was always curious because it was kind of before it got released. It was, it was variously kind of dubbed as his kind of Ty West's kind of slasher movie, eighty slasher movie, or uh, an eighties take on the Jalo. Um, does it kind of does it satisfy that at all, or is that well, really kind of a, a mis- it has a selling? Well, for the first hour or so, it has a mysterious black gloved killer, but there's no kind of stalking scenes. There's lots of scenes of friends of Maxine saying they're going off to the hills, Hollywood Hills, for a party, and then they're never seen again. But you don't actually see what happens to them. You see the aftermath, but that's about it. Um, so yeah, you it's see not like a, a couple slasher movie of stu- I mean, you see like a couple of like POV shots of the killer with the black gloves on, but it's like they're almost in like kind of like side flashes. So it's very minimal. I would hesitate to even call Maxine a slasher movie. I mean, it just skirts by barely. Yeah. Hmm. So it kind of seems from uh, from what people are saying and what you, you and Joseph said, it's kind of it kind of uh, seems like Ty West was kind of quite keen to subvert expectations, which works sometimes, but sometimes it, it doesn't. So I'm, I'm curious to see it, you know when I do get a chance to watch it, and hopefully I will this week. But um, Nathan, have you had a chance to watch Maxine yet? Uh, no, no, and I will admit the lukewarm response is not making me super excited, but I do love the other two movies, so I'll still see it. Um, and maybe, you know, I'll, my expectations will have been lowered and I'll end up loving it. Cool. Excellent. Anything else to say on Maxine or anything else you've seen, Eric? Oh, there's only one other one I've seen. And this one did, um, really knock me out because I absolutely loved it was, uh, in a violent nature. Um, I loved it's, well, he, the director has described it as ambient horror. So I love the fact that there's no score to the film for starters and that it just relies on sound effects, apart from the occasional bit of music you hear coming from a stereo. Um, I mean, I know that the sort of endless scenes of the killer stomping through the forest, not doing much, it will probably try the patience of a lot of people. But I find that there's something kind of zen about watching that, uh, just hearing the sound of footsteps. It was kind of like, you know, that ASMR thing that's been kind of, um, all the rage in the last five years or so. Um, yeah, I really liked. It. I thought the gore when it came was really outrageous in places, particularly that girl doing was she doing yoga on a cliff top, and um, and I just I mean I love the simplicity of it. I was my fear going into it was it was going to be quote elevated horror, and it's not because the the script as written reads just like any trashy Friday the 13th sequel which is great what makes it different is the you know as we know the the 
the point of view that they take uh, with the film, which is just to follow the killer around and the it's the victims this time that are kind of in the background and you don't really, uh, they're not really the focus of the film. Um, I think you, you mentioned, Justin, that you compared it to like watching somebody play the Friday the 13th game on, on PlayStation, um, which it is, I suppose. And I mean, I, I kind of like watching other people play as Jason on the Friday the 13th game. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I thought it had... I thought it had some like suspense and scares or people are saying that because there's no score that the, the film is lacking any kind of oomph but uh, I thought the opposite I mean I there's a there's other films that don't use music like um, I Spit in Your Grave I think uh, benefits from having no score it gives it kind of this unique atmos and uh, I think that's what invi- In a Violent Nature does if I have one criticism of it I think that the finale with Lauren Marie Taylor as kind of this girl who picked uh, this uh, dra- uh Old, older woman who picks up the final girl uh, doesn't really amount to much. It doesn't really go anywhere. And they could have really ended the film 10 minutes earlier. But uh, I know I loved it. I really liked it. I thought it was really refreshing. I thought it, it, for me personally, it felt the closest to an early 80s slasher film that anyone has accomplished um, in this millennium. Uh, you know, there's other people have tried to capture the spirit of the early 80s slasher, and this is the only one that I think has succeeded. What a complete surprise from you, Eric. It's going to be interesting to see because they've just announced a sequel, haven't they? Mm. So um, it doesn't really, well, it kind of lends itself to a sequel, but it kind of doesn't um, I, in, in so much that, I don't know, kind of the whole um, the thing about the sequels is go big or go home. So quite what they'll do with something that is kind of, I mean, the weird thing about In a Violent Nature is you've got this, um, uh, you've got this kind of very over the top gore, um, but then everything else is understated generally. Um, so it, it kind of, it, it's got that kind of weird approach and whether or not that will, that that has the kind of um, the repeat, the sequel potential as in something that's repeatable like the kind of the you know the, the whole setup of say like a friday 13th you can do over and over and over again like like in the game and um uh you, you know it sets itself up um because it's something there's something about it that you know as slasher fans we can really enjoy um but whether or not this really lends itself up for that kind of um that kind of repetition I, I don't know it'll be interesting to see yeah well one of the things i loved about it as well as it's set in the woods which is my favorite location for slashers um, so I think I was trying to think like if this film was set in suburbia or, you know, in a city centre or something, would I be as enthusiastic? And I probably wouldn't. But uh, the fact that it's set in the woods gives it that extra oomph for me. So do you think it will get to part uh, part ten in, in space <laughs> in the violent nature in space? Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> It'd be interesting to see. Yes, and do you like the woods so much? Is that because we we find bears? Yeah, mm, I thought so. So, okay, well, thank you, Eric. Uh, let's see what to... Um, Joseph, have you caught up with anything? I saw Trap. Oh, the, yeah, uh, okay. The new M. Night Shyamalan movie, and um, I really enjoyed this one a lot, actually. First off, the plot is absolutely preposterous and stupid on every level, but that seems to be M. Night's forte, you know, taking obscenely asinine stories and spinning them into something watchable. And that's what he does with Trap. And I think the more insane a premise becomes, the more he tends to cut loose from his, I guess, his kind of artistic excesses and focuses more on the zaniness. And that's what I got from Trap, which is basically, uh, without giving too much of anything away, about a serial killer at a Taylor Swift concert. I mean, that's the, the gist of it. You get M. Knight's daughter in a flagrant case of nepotism playing this uh, pop star who sings... Uh, incessantly and acts with i guess much cessation and unfortunately she's kind of the linchpin for this plot that unfolds at a concert involving the police department who are basically using this concert of this pop star to catch a serial killer who's there in attendance and yes it's as dumb as it sounds but then you also have josh hartnett having so much fun playing against type and kind of outsmarting everyone around him thanks to a hilariously kind of lousy script um, you kind of forget all about M. Night trying to have his cake and eat it too with his daughter, his daughter's inclusion in the film. And it just becomes this dumb, you know, really dumb popcorn thrill ride with characters behaving in such a manner as to kind of beget the next plot twist. 
And, you know, I like those types of thrillers, you know, and M. Night seems to have a knack for them lately. You know, I can appreciate and love his earlier stuff, you know, like Unbreakable and The Sixth Sense. You know, I look at them as exceptional film pieces, and I even love them both, but I think the dumber his films seem to get, the more fun I'm admit, you know, I'm admittedly having, so a big thumbs up for Trap. You know, it's getting tepid reviews, I see, but I had a blast with it. Okay, well, I'm yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing it. I kind of, I, I must admit, I'm kind of quite intrigued by the, the premise, um, and I, I kind of... I, to be honest, it's kind of like with with his movies. Um, even it was old. Um, I didn't mind it. I didn't hate it. I kind of um, it's it's kind of watchable, you know. Um, you know, then they're, they're nothing fantastic, but they're they're not groundbreaking in, in any way. But they're kind of you know they're watchable. Um, so I so I it sounds like this is kind of along those lines, and so yeah, I probably I will probably enjoy it. Whether or not you like M Night's movies, one thing you can say about his movies is they are his movies. I mean, he recycles some plot elements from other films, but they are just so totally him. You can tell when you're watching a M. Night movie. But like I said, the the far out, the more farther out he gets with like his storylines, the more I'm having fun. So go see Trap. I thought I thought it was a lot of fun. Does he still does he still have to shoehorn in the twist at the end or not? Well, this one doesn't really have much of a twist at the end. It's I mean, there's a there's kind of a a twist ish. Halfway through, it's kind of obvious, but um, no, no real big, huge twist. I mean, there's a few little plot twists here and there, but it's kind of a more of a standard thriller. It's kind of something he hasn't really done yet. So it's kind of just one of those popcorn thrillers, I guess. Cool. Excellent. Well, I'm taking no one else has seen The Trap because I don't know it hasn't come out here. So, Eric, I presume you haven't seen it. and um... Not yet, no, um, but I do like... Uh, M. Night Shyamalan's more ludicrous films, the ones that the critics hate. So I loved mm. kind of I loved old, which they all kind of um, jumped on. I was less enthusiastic about a knock on the cabin, which the critics were more enthusiastic about. So uh, trap does sound like something I would I would enjoy. Cool, excellent. Okay, and anything else, Joseph? Uh, no, that's it for me. Cool. Okay. Well, Nathan, how about you? Um, I watched Lake Bodum, a heartwarming tale of friendship that Justin recommended. Oh, yes. Uh, it's um, <clears throat> kind of your classic slasher setup. A uh, group of four uh, friends go to this uh, lake where, you know, years earlier, this um, group of campers were butchered and the killer was never caught. Um, I don't want to say too much about it because it... Um, it takes some directions that I wasn't expecting, which is good. I mean, it, you know, it kind of threw a few wrenches in there that um, I wasn't um, I didn't see coming. So I was actually really happy that, um, you know, it was able to do that. Um, it is a bit um, it, it part of it kind of reminds me of Wolf Creek, you know, just like the I guess like the villain and the um, what the uh, young people go through. Um, you know, something along those lines, uh, I would say kind of reminds me of Wolf Creek. Um, but in general, like it's, it's really good and, and honestly better than I expected it to be. So I would say if you want to see like a pretty good slasher with maybe some, I don't know if I'd call it like twist, not really twist, but just like some it going in directions you wouldn't expect then. Yeah, I would definitely recommend it. Cool. I'm glad you enjoyed it. It's streaming on Shudder where I am. Um, so it may well be in other other areas. It's kind of uh, it's Swedish film. Is it Swedish? No, it's Finland. So um, based on um, there was a real life um, unsolved murder of four campers or three campers, and um, on an island uh, or off a lake off Lake Bodum back in 1960. And this is kind of this kind of got a kind of meta feel to it, where it's the, these four are going back to Lake Bodum, um, and we, we, two of them got the intention of recreating the murder scene. But to see trying to solve out who was the killer, and then it kind of I, it, the question mark remains about is the killer still alive, and all those kind of things. It has fun playing w- with it. But uh, um, Eric and Joseph, did you watch that, or I don't know if you've had a chance to? Not yes, no. no I don't think I've seen it. No. Okay. Well, fair enough. So excellent. Okay, Nathan. Anything else? Uh, no. No, that's all I've had time for. I'm afraid. Cool. I was curious. Have any of you guys seen Long Legs yet? No. You know, not yet. I was I'm meaning hearing, to, but... I'm hearing a lot of people are underwhelmed by it. Yeah. I kind of... Well, I'm going to find out tomorrow, because it's my... Bizarrely, my cinema in Spain here, which has 
um, uh, one English, one film in original language um, uh, a week. And especially in the summer holidays, it's been like things like Inside Out 2 or quite often for some reason they have like Japanese manga, which of course it mean being Japanese with Spanish subtitles. So so um, it does occasionally gets kind of uh, um, odd films uh, like we saw Love Lies Bleeding um, a few months back. Uh, but they're showing Long Legs tomorrow night in uh, in English with Spanish subtitles. Uh, so I'm going to go and see that. So obviously I did actually, well, funny enough, I watched the... Um, the Black Coat's Daughter is Osgood Perkins, one of his earlier films, um, which is also called something else. Was it called January or February or something? Um, and it was kind of, I, I kind of imagine it's a kind of film that might annoy Eric in so much. It's mm-hmm. kind of, that, I would say that it's that kind of slightly elevated horror. Mm-hmm. In so much it's stuff that's going on that doesn't actually make a great deal of sense and you get to the end of it and it's kind of more of a mood piece than a coherent story. So I'd be curious to see um, uh, if Long Legs is if it's different. I mean, obviously, I'm I'm very curious to see uh, Nicholas Cage as a serial killer and Maker Monroe has obviously been in some fantastic movies. He tends to choose good movies. So, so um, yeah, so I'm looking forward to checking that out. Um, a couple of other things. Did I mention um, The Ridge on the past show? No, you mentioned it in private, but uh, not on the show. No, it's I've been because I'm both going back to the UK for a couple of weeks. Um, so uh, I've got family over, uh, so we're going back sort of having a bit of family time. So I've been kind of uh, trying to watch all the movies I need for the podcast, um, and also for Hysteria Lives, sort of trying to get some um, reviews kind of uh, done and ready so I can post while I'm away. And one of them was uh, it was recommended to me. It's a movie called The Ridge uh, from 2005, and it's like a tiny budgeted movie, and it's got that kind of time honoured plot of four friends um uh, go to a cabin in the woods and uh find out uh, an urban legend is true and uh, menaced by a hooded killer and so basically so far so kind of generic uh it's kind of very it is super low budget i mean we're talking kind of thousands of dollars rather than a- anything else but it's actually um it, i think it got released on one of those kind of eight movies on one dvd or something like that kind of one of those kind of movies that was uh um uh, you know so it's like a terrible um uh terrible kind of quality yeah the budget was two thousand four hundred dollars but the funny thing is what well, the funny thing is is the movie actually once it gets going it's very talky in its first half um uh and it's got some like some of the problems you get with low budget movies like the sound uh, quality isn't always great sometimes people talk over each other sometimes it sounds a bit muffled um once you actually get the slasher movie going it's actually really really effective um and uh, the the killer in this is called the Ridge Runner, and it's this legend of this kind of basically runner in this executioner's hood, who um, and in the movie he or she doesn't stop running um, and chasing these uh, teenagers or early twenty somethings around this house and um, offing them one by one, and it's really effective. It's really kind of well done. I was quite surprised. So it just goes to show, even with a budget that small. Um, so uh, yeah, so the Ridge is a kind of bit of a bit of a little gem, a bit of a surprise. So. Um, uh, I don't know where that's available, but I know it did come out on on DVD or uh, VHS back in the day in the uh, in sort of two thousand and five or two thousand and six or so. So uh, so there was that, um, and I think I don't think there was anything else um, apart from obviously what we're covering today. I was trying to find someone to talk to tonight, and I went up to the church to look for an old friend, but he wasn't there. I felt so desperate that I went to confession. <laughs> Isn't that stupid? I haven't done it since I was at school. Well, there's a man. A man I love. <laughs> Are they pure? Are they blameless? Think of the spiritual reward you'll find, Jenny. Here.
Okay, so Pete Walker's House of Mortal Sin unravels a sinister narrative within a quiet English parish. When a devout young woman seeks solace and confession, she falls prey to a predatory priest. As his dark secrets unravel, she must fight to escape his clutches before becoming another victim of his twisted desires. So House of Mortal Sin is, uh, this is my first time watching this film. I've just p- picked up 88 films or brought out a box set of Pete Walker's horror films of the 70s. So this is one of, of seven Blu-rays in it. Uh, the others are Die Screaming Marianne, Flesh and Blood Show, Frightmare, Schizo, The Comeback, and am I missing one? Maybe I'm not missing one, I'm not sure. But anyway, when it comes to British horror, I like... It, I prefer it when it's kind of set in, in contemporary times. Um, I love these 1970s set ones. Uh, Hammer has never really done anything for me with its sort of set in days of yore. Um, you know, I kind of love the, the time capsule uh, vibe you get from Norman J. Warren and Pete Walker's 70s horror output. You know, I was very young in the 70s, but this is the look of this film is kind of how I remember the 1970s is looking. Um, so the House of Mortal Sin is not a whodunit. It's 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 a slasher of sorts, but it's not a whodunit. It's it's about a priest obsessed with trying to punish sinners, uh, in a bid to sort of make this a better world. Um, uh, so the premise is really really far fetched because who can imagine a Catholic priest doing harm to anyone? I mean that's something that would never happen. Um, <laughs> and we know from the outset that uh, this priest is evil. There's no sort of um, trying to hide him, or you know, like literally within the first ten minutes, we discover that he's uh, taping this confession that um, Jenny is giving to him and he's kind of sort of getting off on asking her about her sex life um and you know poor jenny has has sort of ended up in confession almost by accident she just went there to see her friend who happens to be a priest uh, and she ends up uh having a confession with father meldrum uh, and telling him that she had an abortion and this immediately starts an obsession between the uh, between uh, well not between for for you know the priest has this obsession with Jenny then from then on in he kind of fancies her and we discover why later on um he also has a very sinister housekeeper of course played by Pete Walker's favorite actress Sheila Keith and and she's quite sinister in this one because she wears a pair of glasses but one of the lenses is blacked out so um she looks incredibly uh quirky i suppose and sinister um and it's much, she's she's very much uh still playing the the same type of character she did in house of whipcord and uh and the frightmare and the comeback um it was sort of stern and butch uh you know what's what's quite startling about the film and kind of um fun i suppose is is that father meldrum is really brazen about his her evil deeds he you get the vibe that he feels he's completely untouchable because he's a Catholic priest. He's like, nobody will ever believe that I would kill anyone or that I would tape record someone's confessions because I'm a Catholic priest. I can get away with anything I want. Um, and, you know, poor Jenny, on the other hand, she has... You, you, there's films where where uh, the heroine is nobody believes her and you, you sort of feel her frustration throughout much of the movie and the film doesn't have a um, happy ending uh, spoiler alert um, uh, I also love the character of Mrs. Davy in this she's this well I looked up the actress's uh, IMDB page and she's only in her mid 40s when she filmed this but she looks like she's in her late 60s she wears a headscarf and uh, she's the mother of the girl who commits suicide in the pre credit sequence. And she does that old giallo tripe that I know myself and Nathan always sneer at, where she says to somebody, I know the full truth about Father Meldrum. Meet me on Sunday and I'll tell you everything. <laughs> of course, she never makes it to Sunday. Uh, she, served, she served a dodgy wafer at confession. Um, you know, she possibly chokes on it or maybe it's poisoned. So if it's the body of Christ, you could, I wonder if she's actually choking on Jesus's knob. <gasps> but if it's a poisoned wafer, then maybe, maybe Jesus's knob is really toxic and shouldn't, shouldn't be oh. ingested. Mm. You're talking of blasphemy. 
I know. Yeah, see, this is me trying to be outrageous, which is what Pete Walker was trying to do with this film and David McGillivray. They saw that, the, the this is getting into a bit of background, they saw that films like The Devils and The Exorcist, um, because they contained blasphemy, blasphemy, they got huge amounts of publicity from the press. And this is kind of what Pete Walker was hoping for. He was hoping to be so blasphemous and outrageous um, that uh, it would drum up loads and loads of business for him, but which which didn't come to pass, unfortunately. Um, but yeah, the the House of Mortal Sin, I really enjoyed it. As I said, this is my first time watching it. I would say it's probably a little bit too long. It's one hour forty five, maybe twenty minutes off. That might have helped because it does seem to go on a bit. But I do love like there there's certain murders in it. Somebody gets. Well, they don't get killed by a coffee pot, but they're maimed by a coffee pot and then finished off later in the hospital. And there's somebody is, uh, I think we worked out, it's called a sensor, but it's like an incense burner that um, they get, you know, whacked several, several times by. And poor old Stephanie Beecham, you know, soap star of the 80s, gets uh, strangled by rosary beads. So there's tons of sort of blasphemous imagery in the film. I mean, it's not terribly graphic or gory, but, um, you know, it's, 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 I suppose it's implied that, you know, all the instruments of death are, apart from the coffee pot, are uh, sort, of, sort of Catholic symbols. Uh, so, yeah, I really enjoyed it. Love these 1970s set, set horrors, especially British ones, because they seem... They feel they feel much closer to home for me because Britain and Ireland kind of look the same. Um, I just would have edited it slightly, maybe because one hundred and five minutes I think is stretching what is quite a thin plot, you know, out a bit too long. I think. But um, Justin, you probably uh, have a longer history with this film than I do. Uh, yes, I mean I used to have the uh, sort of silver series. I think it was on um, VHS as the Confessional Murders. I think it got re got um it was released to UK screens as House of Mortal Sin and then um released to videos of confessional murders and so I I saw that and I t- picked up the coffin box that was put out by someone I can't remember what it was it's coffin shaped box which had um a Pete Walker collection uh sort of many years ago so yeah I have seen this movie a number of number of times it kind of resonates with me a number of ways because um like Pete Walker I'm kind of very lapsed Catholic I was brought up Catholic. Um, and about the time this was made, um, I was going through First Holy Communion, um, or maybe a little bit later, which is that kind of really weird thing where you get married to Christ. Um, and our Catholic priest, Father uh-huh. Reynolds, he wasn't... You're a gay. What? <laughs> well, it's... I don't know. I'm not quite sure so how it this works. This is religion. Little... Toxic Jesus Cox and being forced into a shotgun Jesus wedding. I know. It's this, very strange. this is religion for you folks. But the weird thing was that all the little girls had to dress up as brides and all the boys dressed up as grooms um, and the first Holy communion. So you were getting married to Christ in oh, some I did, kind of I ways. Didn't know that, I didn't know that was what the symbolism was. <laughs> well, I presume, I presume that's the case. And our Father Reynolds was our Catholic priest. And as far as I know, he wasn't a serial killer, but he was a drunk. Um, and so he used to um, hit the, us children over the head with rolled up, uh, sheet, uh, rolled up newspaper if we um, got uh, our steps wrong in the practice first, first study communion. So. Or if you said anything about Jesus's cock. Boy, it, talk, it, talk about a mouthful of teeth right there. <laughs> well, exactly. So I kind, of my, I'm, I kind of went through three Catholic schools, and I always say, I always thank uh, um, three Catholic schools for making me an atheist. So, uh, so yes, it's a perfect movie for me as a, as a very lapsed Catholic um, that uh, I can enjoy seeing the symbolism. I kind of, paradoxically, I love... Um, really a, a kind of ornate and baroque Catholic symbolism and going to cathedrals and seeing how ridiculous they are and how ornate they are and marvelling at the um, the huge waste of money but the beautiful art and everything I marvelling at the that. opulence <laughs> Opul- exactly the opulence so with this movie it's um, uh, it's it kind of also marries the fact that that kind of mid 70s thing is again I you know I would have been five or six when this movie was made, but this very much reminds me of that that kind of mid seventies kind of Laura Ashley coming off Earth and Wear. Everything was brown, lots of you know um, mini you know small cars and um, ladies with that particular kind of hairdo. Uh, so yeah, it very kind of reminds me of a kind of uh, that early childhood growing up in in the UK. So um, I don't think it's as good as Frightmare. I think Pete Walker. 
um, from what I've read without getting into too much background game, was they struggle with the script on this one. Um, and I agree with you, Eric. It, it certainly could have probably lost 10 or 15 minutes. It would have made it a kind of tighter movie. Um, I know Pete Walker was desperate to shock, and I kind of appreciate that. Uh, and I'm sure we talk about how that kind of failed or didn't fail. Um, I mean, I, I kind of, I, you know, I really like uh, Stephanie Beecham in this and Susan Ben Halligan are, are great. Um, and again, that kind of real mid-70s uh, feel to it. Uh, Sheila Keefe, I, you know, she's not as effective. Uh, you know, she's not given as much to do here as she was in Frightmare, uh, which, of course, is the pinnacle of her work with Pete Walker. But she still has, there's some, her turn of phrase, it's kind of like um, when um, Father Melksham was uh, kind of, he just killed somebody and buried them in the grave. And then she just turns to him and says, you should wipe your feet if you've been to the graveyard, Father. And just the way she says that is just kind of very chilling. And, you know, she's she is fantastic um, in this. So I also, I, the ending, which because we kind of spoil, I kind of guess, is that, because we kind of always do, is that the end... Um, uh, he, he, the killer uh, convinces another priest that it was actually Sheila Keefe's character who's killed everyone. Um, but then he puts on his black leather gloves and the uh, the kind of suggestion is he's about to go and kill Susan Penhaligon. Um So it's very, um, if you've seen Frightmare, the, you know, the ending of that is much more nihilistic. And although it doesn't actually show the murder um, of the kind of final girl, for, on a better term, from an early 70s movie it's or mid well actually kind of mid 70s it was made the year before this um it kind of it was much felt much more effective than the ending of this it just seemed like a little bit of a pale imitation so i overall i would say this um uh this is probably my second favorite pete walker movie after frightmare i find um the comeback has got some great bits in it like there's a fantastic scene with uh, the killer running downstairs with an axe and schizo i've not seen for years i need to catch up with them again but i think uh frightmare by far is my favorite pete walker movie um this kind that comes i wouldn't say a re- close second but certainly is my second favorite pete walker movie um i just think he's kind of trying to outdo what he did in frightmare but not necessarily succeeding having said that there's lots of good stuff in this i even on such a tight budget um uh, he he kind of gets kind of quite Gets really good performances from them. I thought um, again, um, uh, Susan Penhaligon and Stephanie Beecham, uh, sisters, kind of. There's a kind of definite. They definitely feel like real characters um, and uh, kind of sympathetic to them. And also their kind of their lodger, um, the kind of the, the priest, a conflicted priest who's kind of who um, starts developing uh, feelings. Stephanie Beecham. I think it kind of works. And makes breakfast in his underpants. Well, the he breakfast, breakfast in his underpants. The yeah. breakfast isn't in his underpants. But he's making it whilst just only wearing underpants. Well, exactly. So frying up a sausage or two. Um, so um, I'd also I I'd want to mention, of course, if you know um, Frightmare, then uh, Kim Butcher, the very aptly named Kim Butcher, who was the um, uh, the evil sister on in Frightmare, uh, makes a cameo appearance at the beginning of this movie, and um, she's kind of starts the whole ball rolling really because she throws herself out of a bedroom window, um, uh, and we find out later that. Uh, Father Melksham has um, has kind of basically uh, kind of taunted her about the fact that she's pregnant and she she's so conflicted that she kills herself. And of course, it reminded me of uh, an episode um, when Eric threatened to throw himself out of a, his um, bedroom hmm. window on the podcast. If you remember, if you remember back, I can't remember which episode it was. We do reference it sometimes. So I wondered, was that a reference? To, of course, you hadn't seen Frightmare, had you? So it's life imitating art. Uh, I hadn't seen House of Mortal Sin then. No, no. Oh, yeah, sorry, House of Mortal Sin. So, so I thought that was funny. The other thing I was just going to mention was that um, it's interesting about how the how the kind of shadow of the Jalo was still kind of um, you know you you see this like a uh, a number of British horror films from the time, especially the kind of psychological ones, uh, definitely have kind of a Jalo y feel to them. Um, this not necessarily apart from the ki- the the killer priest wears black leather gloves, and I noticed that reading doing some background on this that. Um, one of the uh, the critics from the Guardian said that the the movie had an Italiante flavor, which I'm presuming it was a reference to the the giallo. So, so yeah, there's still that kind of feel rubbing off in it. Although, as Eric said, it's certainly not a who done it. But uh, yeah, I mean, if you're a fan of British seventies British horror, you'll lo- you'll love this. Um, so yeah, definitely a, re- a recommend from me. But uh, again, with the caveat, I don't think it's as um, Frightmare still stands head and shoulders as his best kind of shock feature. 
Yeah, I would agree. Uh, Nathan, what do you think? Um, I'm going to agree uh, as well. I think Frightmare is Pete Walker's best film. Um, and, and like Justin was saying, the ending to this one is not near as nihilistic as the one in Frightmare. Because like the ending in Frightmare, you know what's about to happen. Uh, but the ending to this one, almost, I mean, when I first watched it, I won't lie, I almost thought it was missing a final act. Because I was like, you know, I mean, I know what it's implying is that he's on his way to kill her. But I mean, any number of things could happen which could prevent it. So in my opinion, she didn't die. So that's what I say happened. But anyway, um, I feel like there are characters in this movie that seem to have zero will to survive. Um, Like her friend Robert, that the priest has no weapon, nothing. And it's an old man. And he's just letting him slap him around this apartment like it's nothing. And at one point, the guy even grabs a letter opener and threatens to kill him, and the priest just knocks it out of his hand with, like, you know, you know, not much effort. So I was like, dude, like, grab something and actually use it. But anyway, um, and then, of course, we have the um, the mother who, you know, and Eric uh, brought up that uh, we love that trope of, you know, oh, I know everything, meet me here, and then you course they die but i was also thinking it's also ridiculous to me that she decided to go meet the priest in a dark empty church to tell him that she knows he did it so i'm like you are just going to go tell this murderer that you know he's a murderer <laughs> while you're alone i love it when movies do this i swear <laughs> I mean, who in their right mind would do that although the woman didn't seem to be in her right mind anyway to be fair um but um yeah i think the um the weapons the killer uses are interesting. The whole like Catholic imagery, um, the whole thing with the, oh, gosh, I can't remember sarcophagus. What'd you guys call it? Sensor. Sensor. Okay. So the whole thing with that sensor, I thought was a very like inventive death, uh, death scene. So I was like, that's, that's really cool. I think the movie has a lot of good atmosphere. Um, and of course, Sheila Keith is fantastic. Even if, you know, this role is a lot smaller uh, for her, uh, I think the actor playing the priest uh, was really good as well. Um, you know, and, and and might I just say, I find this priest to be a bit of a hypocrite. And the reason I say that is because, I mean, he's doing confessionals and stuff. And, you know, he records her, um, which is against Catholic law or whatever it's called. Oh, that's what you have a problem with, with the Catholic Church. I'm, I'm still going. Because um, <laughs> I'm like, yeah, it, it's it's against the law. But then, not only that, he lies about it and, and says, you know, uh, you know, he, he, he tells lies and, and kills and everything. I'm like, how has he gone this far without not getting caught yet? I mean, hmm. he's completely insane. And like, um, I, th I think it was you, Eric, or Justin. Um, he's just so brazen with his attacks. Like, the one I brought up with her friend Robert. Like, he goes there with no weapons, no anything. I mean, any number of things could have happened. But it just happened to pan out well for him. Um, so, yeah, I don't know how much longer his luck could hold out. Um, and I found it um, interesting that, you know, the I guess the quote-unquote good priest, the younger one, um, he was so easily like talked into covering this up when he thought that, you know, Sheila Keith's character was the murderer. Like he was totally fine with covering it up for the good of the church. I'm like, this movie makes the church look horrible. I mean, it's I like, don't think it needed the movie to accomplish that. <gasps> feat, so, <laughs> Goodness. We're heathens on this show. Um, but yeah, I, I really, um, really enjoy the movie. I do think it could have been a little bit shorter, but, um, you know, I liked it and all anyone needs to know is that, oh, wait, wait, it is frustrating to me. And, uh, you know, a lot of movies do this, but it's very frustrating to me when nobody believes the main character. And I mean, the hospital staff in this movie are about as useless as the staff in hospital massacre. She goes and visits her friend, right? And the priest shows up. And, of course, she's like, get away from me, get away from me. And the people come in, and, like, none of the doctors, nurses, none of them listen to her. They just assume she's hysterical. But then when they go back into the room, her friend's dead. And the only person in that room was the priest at the time. I mean, we're not dealing with Mensa members here. <laughs> 
I mean, this these people are just so stupid. I mean, it, it should at least raise an eyebrow like, OK, like he was fine or, you know, like he was alive uh, when we took her out of the room and the priest was in here for all of 10 seconds and now he's dead. I mean, come on. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure this out. But there are a lot of stupid people in movies. What can you say? And it's not like I've probably never done anything stupid in my life. But I will tell you this. I would have listened to her. We would have stopped that priest. She and I would have hmm. gone Nancy Drew Hardy boys. And we would have, like, sussed him out. And we would have um, thrown him off the top of the church. That would have been a fitting end. <laughs> well, you probably, well, you could have done that. But you've probably been arrested for murder. Well, no. I mean, in this um, day and age, I mean, priests can go out and just butcher people, you know, pretty easily i'd say i could get you know get away with it that is possibly true <laughs> but anyway i'm joking a lot but it really is like a great movie a great time piece of the 70s and you know well worth watching um i'm just kind of picking at it a little bit for fun but highly recommended cool joseph yeah uh, um any movie that sticks it to the catholic church in any capacity is going to get my you know, my seal of approval, quality be damned. But thankfully, uh, House of Mortal Sin or The Confessional is a pretty good little black comedy uh, proto-slasher with a great performances and uh, some of Walker's flashiest direction, in my opinion. But my problem is that I also think it's one of those movies that reminds me of a bit from Family Guy where Meg is trying to describe the actor Chris O'Donnell and she says, he's not fat, but he's not skinny. He's not tall or short, but he's not fat or thin. He's not handsome or ugly, and he's not young or old. He's not loud or quiet. He's not memorable, but I know who he is. And that's kind of how I feel about How Some Mortal Sin. Like, I can laugh at the usage of all the religious artifacts as weapons because, you know, hey, death to religion and all that, you know, stick it to them. But at the same time, the movie is kind of dreary, dreary to sit through on a plot level as we know who the killer is and there's no real mystery. And he, you know, he lives with his vegetative mother and I'm looking at the beautiful cinematography, but I'm not quite engaged with anyone or the story as it's admittedly heavy. And so it kind of starts to feel like this would have made a better gag reel or a short film to me. Like once you see maybe one or two of these religious murder gags, the joke kind of just hits a wall perhaps. Um, all the stuff with abortion, the hot topic issues, I get it. I admire it. I'm thankful, you know, that they had the chutz put a stick to, stick it to this cesspool of an organization. But it's never really all that entertaining to me on a slasher movie level. Um, and like you said, Eric, it's stretched out into nearly two hours. You know, it's handsome to look at, but it's 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 much too long. And I guess what I'm ultimately trying to say <laughs> is that I wasn't I wasn't entertained, but I wasn't bored. And I didn't hate the film, but I didn't like it. You know, Walker's done better, but he's done worse, and so on. So, middle of the road. Controversial. Yes. Why don't you tell us what you really think about the Catholic Church? <laughs> I think it's also, to be honest, it's. Um, I think sometimes uh, it's films that are not made in in your home country sometimes travel di slightly differently, perhaps. I mean, I don't think I don't think House of Mortal Sin is a is a perfect movie by any stretch, um, but there are certain things in there that I, for me and Eric, might hit more chords potentially than uh, for for you. But I don't, I don't know. Like you know, I was never a part of the Catholic Church. I was never a part of any church uh, of any denomination. But you know, I've I've read the horror stories and I get it. You know, I get you know what this movie's trying to say and. You know, like I said, I, I love the time period detail. The performances are great. I just, you know, as funny as some of it is as well, I just also think it's kind of dreary, and that's my problem. It's it's a movie of two halves. Like, it wants to be funny, but it's kind of depressing at the same time, so it's it's hard to really get into. Well, fair enough. So, um, well, let's move on to some background. So, Eric, do you, what do you have for us? Fight the real enemy. Eh? Ch I'm channeling Sinead O'Connor, Rip. Okay. Ripping up the picture of the Pope on Saturday Night Was it Saturday Night Live? Yes, I'm so glad she was vindicated. She was so ahead of her time. Yes. 
Um, okay, so for my behind the scenes, I need to thank the book Making Mischief, the films of Pete Walker. I don't have it beside me here, so I can't remember who wrote it, but um, thank you to them for providing me with the following information. Uh, so yeah, so as I said, Walker and McGillivray, uh, Pete Walker and David McGillivray wrote this in an attempt to, to make it as controversial and as blasphemous as they could as a way of drumming up lots and lots of publicity. And apparently at the time the film was released, they even... Uh, planted a story that made it onto the front of the trashy Sunday People newspaper claiming that the the there was real human blood used in the murder scenes um, but that still failed to uh, ignite uh, any outrage amongst people um, you know David McGillivray said that uh, he recalls Pete Walker being filled with glee at the thought of um, having a theme even more controversial than the skull drilling cannibalism of Frightmare. Uh, McGillivray also suggested a working title of Mass Murder. That is a phenomenal title. I love that. That's <laughs> yeah. awesome. I don't think it was ever seriously considered, though. Wow, uh, um, that is cool. <laughs> yeah, so a rough synopsis uh, was written in the summer of 1974 and, fo- and got approval from Walker to get it expanded into a proper screenplay. But there was a lot of difficulty getting it sort of fleshed out. Uh, if they finally got it, uh, uh, f- the script finalized in December of 1974, just as Frightmare was opening in cinemas. Um, McGillivray did some research. He went to the Catholic Church and he said that he had to kind of pretend that uh, he was there doing research for a respectable movie, whereas he really was just looking around the church scene. Ooh, what could I use in here that that could I could use to murder people with? Um, the budget was 60,000 of your British pounds, which sounds really cheap, actually. The The church they used was a deconsecrated Anglican church. So Anglican churches don't have confessional booths. Uh, so they had to build one and install it in the church. But everything else uh, was already there. So they saved a lot of money on that. Peter Cushing was the original choice to play Father Meldrum. Uh, but he declined, not because he hated the script, but because he he said he didn't want to be playing villains anymore. Uh, other names like Lee J. Cobb were considered, but eventually the role went to Anthony Sharp, who's uh, actually a cousin of James Blunt. Really? Mm. Anthony Sharp, James Blunt. Oh, dear. Sorry. Oh, Very no. Cool. I didn't get it at first. I was like, <laughs> no. okay. Yeah, no, just, to be, I just, just because I think of something different when you say Blunt. <laughs> Nathan. <laughs> it's like having our own Cheech and Chong. Yeah. Okay. So just to be clear, Anthony Sharp is no relation to James Blunt. Uh, Anthony Sharp was actually in A Clockwork Orange, which ironically Pete Walker hated and accused of being corrupting. Um, it was filmed in the spring of 1975 with location shooting taking place in Berkshire. Uh, is that anywhere near your you justin in guildford uh not really well okay. it's not i mean it's kind of around kind of i think it's north of london isn't it oh is so it? okay i'm kind of west of london okay so filming started on february the 17th 1975 for five weeks um so uh stephanie beecham had quite a horror cv at this stage she'd been in the nightcomers with marlon brando she was in and now the screaming starts and dracula ad 1972 she would go on to appear in pete walker's next film schizo and she was also in in seminoid the 1981 norman j warren alien movie uh, and she would of course go on to be famous for the colbys and dynasty and beverly hills 90210 and sequest dsv or whatever it's called um some critical reception financial times said it was a load of old rubbish the evening news called it nasty and banal the sunday times called it squalid horror and the monthly film bulletin commented on the limp acting sluggish direction and script contrivances so it didn't get a lot of love um in a 19 in a sorry in a 2014 on stage interview with the barbican in london uh Pete Walker stated that this was the favorite of all his films. Um, and uh, in 1982, P- or in 1983, I think it would have been, Pete Walker sort of retired from making movies. Uh, and he went into the more lucrative business of buying and restoring cinemas. Uh, and uh, as of, uh, 
when I can't remember when I picked out this this newspaper clipping, but I think it was the early noughties. He was living in a smart Surrey cul-de-sac. Now Surrey is where you were from, Justin, isn't it? It is. Um, uh, yeah. Yes, but I don't think um, my parents didn't live in a cul-de-sac. I was that'd be funny if he was my na- their neighbour. But yeah, he had uh, he, apparently uh, he'd made enough money to indulge in his passion for Victorian slot machines. That's a very niche interest to have. Um, he says he doesn't miss the old his old life of making movies because he said every time I made a picture I'd get piles. Um. <laughs> <laughs> what a what a confession that is. Talk about yeah. the confessional. Exactly. And that's all I have. Nathan, do you have any feedback or any um, behind the scenes for us? Uh, yes. Um, ah. Well, thou shalt not kill is in the Ten Commandments. Yeah. Um, thou shalt not bear false witnesses is in the Ten Commandments. So obviously this priest hasn't studied anything. So he needs to go back to priest school. He does. Yeah, he flunked. Hmm. Is that it? Yeah. Joseph? I think what you were looking for from Nathan was, no. Yeah, that's what I was wanting. <laughs> so you can have that from me for this. Okay. My, my head's a little spacey from the painkillers, my bad. Yeah, from the painkillers. Um, Justin? Well, first of all, a corrections corner. It's um, Father Meldrum. I call him Father Milksham for some reason, so I do apologize for that. But um, I thought you um, called him Father Milkshake for a second there. <laughs> maybe I did. But uh, yeah, I mean, I've got that book, Making Mischief, as well. So, um, uh, so much of what you said, but literally, is um, you said what I was going to say, which I know is a kind of running <laughs> joke, but that was actually <laughs> correct. So, one, a couple of other things that I'm not sure if you mentioned, but obviously, Frightmare when it came out, it used the um, uh, the, the bad um, the, the, the quotes from newspapers and the reviews saying how awful the movie was on its poster. So uh, it, um, Pete Walker was very keen to kind of sell his movies through outrage. And it's, it's funny the kind of time this came out, this came out in the same, you know, around the same time as kind of punk broke. So it had this kind of slightly uh, anarchic feel because Pete Walker was very much building on the idea of outrage. He wanted to shock and that's where he said he, that's where he, he, his niche was, was to, uh, um, uh, I think he's quoted uh, as saying, my movies deliberately deal with distasteful subjects. They're out to shock people. Being sensational, that's my forte. So the this kind of thing the Sex Pistols and Punk sort of did the same year. So it's kind of interesting uh, comparison. Um, the It was one of the first films, his first film, that um, was uh, distributed by a major, which is Columbia. Um, and it got its um, premiere in the prestigious West End in February of 1976. And it's also, I think that's where I saw the Silver, Silver Series um, VHS when that came out that was out on Columbia as well um, I you mentioned which I thought I, I'm, I'm sure that was just some press ballyhoo wasn't it I'm sure no real human blood was used in the special effects I think even back then they would have realised that actually splashing actors and actresses with um, real uh, human blood was probably a, a recipe for all sorts of infections so I'm sure that was just some some um, something that they kind of made up uh, I, um, I did find one thing um, uh, I did find which uh, Stephanie Beecham has a memoir called Many Lives and she dedicates all of about three quarters of a page to this movie. Um, but uh, she said that she actually, um, uh, it's, there's an irony here, I think, because she says that getting House of Mortal Sin um, uh, was because God's golden light continued to glow on me, which I think was an irony given the um, the kind of nature of the movie. Uh, And she said that it was because her baby, she'd only just given birth to her daughter. Um, So it meant that she could bring her uh, baby to work. Uh, And she said that Pete Walker was lovely, uh, but they grew impatient with the sparks, which is kind of like kind of UK slang, I guess, for electricians on the set. Um, And Pete Walker is to say, come on, hurry up. Stephanie's tits are filling up. So um, (laughs) she... (laughs) which she thought was hilarious. Um, and uh, it's apparently she called Susan Penhaligon Susie Penhooligan for some reason. Now, I tried to find out if there was any reason. Did you hear that, to... Eric? Susie's a hooligan. <laughs> but I, 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 <gasps> I, couldn't find, I couldn't find any reason. Um, maybe uh, Susan Penhaligon was uh, some kind of tear away on the set. I, I don't know. Um, but she went on to be, uh, There's an, it was like a soap, not soap opera, like a miniseries called a Bouquet of Barbed Wire which projected her to sort of household status um, in the UK the same year in 1976. Um, and uh, she did say, and I, I think uh, it looks like that biography, well, not biography, 
well autobiography i can guess her memoirs might be quite fun um uh it's a shame she doesn't seem to talk too much about horror stuff maybe she talks about some of her other movies i don't think she mentioned schizo schizo at all but um uh she did talk about seeing um house of mortal sin at its premiere in london with her husband who looked suitably shocked um and she said uh the film was unspeakably bad uh but then she also said in her memoir but i wouldn't have missed it for the world so uh and i'd say that actually uh stephanie beecham um unlike linda day george is very convincing at playing a corpse in this uh she she has to lie in the back while other things are going on after she's been strangled with rosary beads and she actually looks she managed not to blink or move or uh, see her chest going up and down like uh unlike linda day george in mortuary but uh uh, which of course, which um, is a movie that I've just done a retrospective of on Hysteria Lives. So if you want to check that out, so which the press commented about, but uh, yeah, so this was followed, wasn't it, by I think Schizo a couple a year or two later. So I'm interested in that that box set you've got, Eric, because obviously I have the because um, I saw it had the Flesh and Blood show, which I don't know if we covered or not, but that was a kind of a proto slasher set on the on a kind of a pier isn't it with a, like shakespearean a troop of actors being killed off by a shakespearean actor um but it came in it's good part it's in 3d there's a, yeah a, but a the, 3D. The, th- yeah. the 3d on the blu-ray is just anaglyph so you, it includes some red green glasses for you to wear and it's not very good it's not are you i was, was going to ask if you've tried it out yeah no yes okay so anyway so that's all the background i have okay and i can tell you actually let me just check i've got the book here let me grab it it's um if anyone is interested in uh, making mischief, it's by Steve Chibnall, the cult films of Beat Walker. So, awesome. Mm-hmm. So, um, what was the consensus on the group, Joseph? Well, before I get to that, I wanted to mention one more thing, real quick. Um, I can't really speak for Nathan, but it was incredibly difficult to find Pete Walker films on VHS in my area back in the day. Was it hard for you, Nathan, to find his movies? The only one I can really remember seeing with frequency was uh schizo or schizoid or whatever it was called for me it was um, fratmare i, I could yeah. find fratmare at several places but i don't remember ever seeing you know house of mortal sin or um the comeback um in any of my local video stores but they did have fratmare because that box scared me okay well what was the consensus on the group joseph 18 comments overall for House of Mortal Sin and a lot of really good ones from Facebook and Instagram in particular. So it was tough choosing the standouts for each of those. But uh, on Facebook, Sean Guerrero says the brilliant premise is executed effectively, sustaining a dark allure throughout, bolstered by compelling performances with director Walker crafting a superb atmosphere. But I can only imagine it would be even better if it were delivered more gruesome, if it delivered more gruesome kills and over the top violence throughout. But for what we get, considering this is the proto slasher era, it is one intriguing Catholic slasher. Uh, Heathen73 from Instagram writes Love it, wonderfully directed with a dark, sinister undertone, a quintessential British gem. Delighted you got round to this one, lads. And finally, the trash pit on YouTube wins by default. He was the as he was the only one to comment there, and he says he's never heard of House of Mortal Sin, but it's one he'll have to check out. And to that trash pit, I'd say it's not bad. It's not good. It's not. Eh, you get the joke. Uh, follow us on Facebook and Instagram to stay up to date on all that we're doing. Listen on Amazon. Apple, iHeartRadio, Spotify, YouTube, and about a billion other podcatchers, both good and terrible, join us on Patreon for as little as a dollar per month to help support the show. Or if you're financially inclined, select a tier that fits your budget for that extra monthly bonus content. That's patreon.com forward slash the hysteria continues, all one word. And that goes for our email address as well, the hysteria continues at gmail.com. Mr. Kurzweil, do you have a joke of the week for us? I don't, but I know someone who does, and I'm sure mm. it'll be. I'm, I can't. I can't even imagine where he's going to go with this. It's my joke of the week. It's so, so quick and fantastic. Did you hear that the Welsh singer of Goldfinger has taken a vow of chastity? Oh, silly bassy. Celeb- celebassy. <laughs> God. Celebassy. Celebassy. I don't get that one. 
I commend the effort, man. I do. <laughs> There's so many things you could have joked about, Eric, and you went there. Shirley Bassey is the singer. I was, I was almost sure silly you would have gone with another Walker joke, like Walker feet, something. I don't know. Or something yeah, I thought that would be too obvious. <laughs> yeah, I think you've done that once before. Did we cover Frightmare? Or is this our first Pete Walker film? No, we've done Frightmare. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, Eric, uh, that, I, I take it that won't be, you won't be debuting that at uh, Edinburgh Fringe next year. Well, I was planning to. Okay. Right. Anyway, well, let's draw a discreet veil over that. And uh, I think, think we have some feedback, don't we? So who would like to go first? Okay. I've got one here. Let me just find it. Okay. This is from Rob Balducci. And he says, hello, Hysterians. Just wanted to give some feedback on a couple of recent episodes. Finally found a copy of Crinoline Head and watched that along with Dollface. I'm not huge on direct-to-streaming or DVD movies like Dollface, but found it pretty well made and engaging. Crinoline Head was a little tougher to get through, but that bitchy character alone, I forget her name, uh, who gets her face pushed into the toilet, made it worthwhile. I also watched Killing Spree and thought it was a lot of fun. I had seen Tim Ritter's Truth or Dare and Creep way back in the day. I even reviewed them on my old blog back in 2010. And I remember thinking they were pretty good. I rated them each 6 out of 10. Definitely one of Nathan's better picks. There you go, Nathan. Some praise for Killing Spree. Last, oh, I like this. Lastly, I must side with Eric and Nathan regarding the latest quiz. I don't think Pino Pilalgio, Pilalgelo, uh, should warrant a point for Justin. Sorry. Well, Justin? Well, I would say I was asking for half a point anyway. And yeah, well, it doesn't even deserve half a point. Well, it does. And uh, well, No, you were asking for a point. Well, I asked for a point originally, and then I asked for half a point, and then you, you were kind of screaming and having a tantrum about that. Yeah, and you, and you got half a point. No, he didn't get half a point. I didn't give him anything. Yeah, oh, exactly. did you not? Okay. Well, then no. oh. So you think so I should... went just... off on a tirade for no reason. <laughs> 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 so anyways we know last time when you weren't um, here on the show Eric uh, I did play that clip of Nathan agreeing I should have got that half point oh, oh you Nathan. mean that AI that you yeah. <laughs> AI. oh yeah that's right we've, we've got the budget for that on the history continues Yeah. so anyway, anyway that will run and run so this is the kind of magic you can uh, you can uh, expect on the uh, on our Patreon yes Okay, so Rob goes on. That's it for now. Can't wait for your What Have They Done To Your Daughters episode as it's a favourite of mine from Rob Balducci. But uh, P.S. He, <laughs> he has his own joke of the week, guys. Are you ready for this? Did you hear that Jamie Lee Curtis is going to be in a new Haunted House movie? It's going to be called Paranormal Activia. That was so uh, hilarious. That was so much funnier than your joke, Eric. Hey! <laughs> I didn't hear anyone <laughs> laughing at it. I was Ugh. laughing silently. Sorry, Rob. I was crying silently. <laughs> <laughs> Nathan, do you, you have some feedback for us, I think? Yes. Um, it says, hey, fe hello, fellas. Just caught the slasher-esque movie The Fantasist from 1986 on Tubi and thought it would be a cool one for you guys to cover since it takes place in Dublin and stars Timothy Bottoms, Eric's joke of the week, half done. <laughs> <laughs> uh, loving the podcast as always and wish you well Lou from Boston I've not seen the fantasist Lou is that from the same director as Wicker Man is it it might be actually because it's I mean you had like the iguana with a tongue of fire didn't you set in Dublin so I have heard of the fantasist but I've never seen it is it Robert Hardy is it Robert Hardy I think so yeah yeah Robin well, is it Robin or Robert mm, let me I'm see not sure fantasist. maybe I'm thinking Robert Hardy maybe the actor but anyway but yeah, no, that's uh, that would be a, a good one to check out. That's Robin Hardy. Robin, okay. Robert Hardy's the actor, isn't it? Yeah, and there's a number of people in it who who were also in Rawhead Rex, which would have been 1986 as well. Ah, okay. Mm -hmm. Was well, Timothy Bottoms was he in uh, Blind Date, the Nico Mastarakis movie? Or or is he the, is he not the one who's in that um, Killer Fish movie that we re did on Patreon? Or is that Joseph Bottoms? Oh, well, I know the... Timothy Bottoms played George Bush in a sitcom, but I don't remember him. I wasn't. He, he was in Blind Date, wasn't he? I think. Yeah, I think so. Well, one of them. There was. There's a couple of Bottoms brothers, wasn't there? Which sounds like oh, some yeah. kind of some kind of video you might <laughs> find in certain channels on in a Spanish supermarket. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but um, okay. Anyway, so yes, well, we'll look out for the fantasists, and I have one here. This is from Miles Hamer. 
uh, says, "What's up, you selfish relatives? Hopes all well. Uh, sorry, hope all's well with your good selves. Two questions, if you don't mind. Firstly, like Eric and Nathan, I'm a huge 3D fan, and will buy watch anything in the now sadly dwindling format. However, my holy grail is the true 3D blue of Friday the Thirteenth Part Three, 3D." There doesn't appear to be a proper 3D release of the of it outside some bank crippling box set from a few years back. Do you guys have it? It's okay, I'm not asking for a lender or anything, just curious. The nearest I've got to it is the crappy anaglyph broadcast version taped off uh, sorry, taped off the UK's channel four from two thousand and nine. Remember that. Um I have that the Screen Factory uh, box set. And it does look spectacular, and I think I'm not alone, am I? Yeah, I have it as well. I think it's it's great. Yeah, it's it's really awesome. It's it's a real shame the whole three D thing kind of has gone the way because you can't you can't buy three D TVs anymore, um, uh, which is a real shame. And the only way to watch it, it which is, is great, is obviously on on projectors and stuff. And I'm not even sure if the newer projectors do three D. Uh, so, which is a real shame. But yeah, if you ever do get a chance to see it, it does look fantastic. And that Friday, that I do remember that Channel Four broadcast and struggling through that. So uh, you know, anaglyph would do it a pinch it kind of worked better i think in some of those old 50s movies um but um when things were kind of like um down not you know sort of uh retrograded or downgraded from um from sort of real 3d to anaglyph i don't think it worked nearly as well no i do remember that uh channel channel 4 broadcast yeah i mean i'm sad as well because i only jumped on the home 3d bandwagon in 2021 so it was i think there might have been half a dozen 3d blu-ray releases since then yeah i mean, sure it'll make a comeback at some point but hopefully uh i know there's i uh, talking of um obviously the jaws 3d um jaws 3 3d uh which was like uh, in uh real 3d i think but that was a kind of pretty terrible 3d disc if i remember correctly everything was a bit major but i think that maybe the i did actually see that at the cinema and i can't remember but i, I kind of we talked about the 3d before and about how you kind of you know you actually saw things kind of above your head or kind of you know really you know you never it's never really been able to replicate that in um at home that kind of uh that kind of 3d effect if you're in the right place in the cinema but uh, did you read that stuff about they've they remastered jaws 3 with ai yeah all and all the all the background extras have weird faces now yeah and like f- seven fingers and things like that which is which is pretty crazy oh i gotta so, see this <laughs> if, you, if you google it it's kind of like uh jaws 3 um, AI and remaster, and it's kind of they've got they've yeah they've kind of close up people's faces, and they've got that real kind of you know like AI has that kind of um, cheese dream nightmare feel to it sometimes yeah, when you yeah. see melted faces and stuff, and it kind of looks like that. So, uh, but um, Miles goes on to say, also a request if I may, could you cover either uh, of the wonky toolbox murders at some point, please? Neither is exactly a classic, but between the originals, Grubby Sleaze or Toby, Toby Hooper's extremely strange redux it should provide or provoke some interesting discussion or at the very least a terrible uh, uh, stroke brilliant joke from eric keep up the great work Uh, much love miles hamer and he says p.s justin should have been uh, awarded two points for that no he didn't he did not say that he said that i can see it right here in in yeah well i have access to that as well (laughs) and let me see no there is no p.s on that you didn't get sent that bit. I got sent it. So, My- Miles, um, he sent a fax over with it on there in 3D. <laughs> so, okay. So, um, well, that was uh, the Confessional Murders. Uh, so, uh, aka House of Mortal Sin. But um, what are we covering next time? Yeah, we'll be shooting ahead uh, a few years into 1983 to discuss the French Super 8 murder drone slasher, I guess. Ogroff, uh, Mad Mutilator, and uh, we'll be joined by listener Matt Minter, who chose it. So, Ogroff, Mad Mutilator. Okay, well, it's going to be interesting to talk about, and also talk about is it French Nathan-y? horror. I imagine it probably is a bit nathan Yeah. Um, <laughs> I mean, it's Super 8. Looks shot on video because it's Super 8, but um, I think it's... It, it, if I remember correctly, it's kind of violent shit-ish, so I'm not really... I'm not, I don't really know what to expect if I'm going to enjoy it or not, but it will be interesting to discuss. Okay, well, so uh, yeah, it's going from sixty thousand pounds to six uh, six francs by the sound of it. Um, 
<laughs> but okay, so well, yes. Um, and what are we playing out with, Eric? Oh, we are playing out with. Oh, yeah, I confess by the beat or the English beat, as Nathan and Joseph. Oh, would know. good choice. Cool, excellent. Okay. Right, well, we'll be heading over to France uh, next time. And, of course, you can also join us over on Patreon. France! Um, <laughs> and we've got lots of uh, good stuff and some very bad stuff going on over there. So do join us over on Patreon if you get a chance. Um, okay, so uh, I guess um, I say, um, oop, I'll say... Uh, You'll say bing! bing. <laughs> I shall say um, sort of blessings uh, to you, my children, and uh, say goodbye to the good people. Bye. Goodbye. So long. Bye-bye, all you sinning cocksuckers. Oh! <gasps>